All right, so check this out. I recently sold a subwoofer that I'm not using to a person who's local to me. And they asked, hey, I saw that you're reviewing older type vintage type speakers. Maybe vintage isn't the right word, but older speakers. And said, I have a pair of Kef reference model 203. The original one, not the 203-2 that you often see reviewed. Would you be interested in reviewing those? And I was like, heck yeah. So he brought them over, took the subwoofer home with him, and left the speakers with me to review and demo for a little while. This speaker was produced between 2001 and 2006 and retailed for approximately $5,000, according to Kef. I actually emailed them and asked them for that information, which today's money is about $8,000. Now, do I think that's a great value in today's money? Uh, no, I don't would say it's a value, but given everything that you've got and you kind of put things in perspective at that time, the build quality is substantial and the measurements and the sound are all incredible. So I think at that point in time, $5,000 probably would have been a really fair asking price for these speakers, given everything that you get. I hooked them up in my living room, powered with a pair of March Audio P501 Class D mono blocks. So one separate for the left, one separate for the right. And over the past couple of weeks, I've been using different sources. So initially I started off with Mini DSP. I think it's the Flex HTX as my pre-processor, if you will. And then recently, it's been the Wim Ultra. Wow, is the best way that I can describe these speakers. If I could find a pair local for sale for me, I'd probably be all over them. So this is what I'm telling you to do. Look on your Facebook marketplace or your Craigslist. See if you can find a pair of these. The Kef 203, reference 203, or maybe even the 203-2 slash 2. If you find a pair that is within your budget, I say buy them. I think these are probably going to be one of those hidden gems, much like the Infinity Primus 360 that I reviewed a few weeks ago. These things are just awesome. Soundstage width, radiation, the items placed within the soundstage. Everything sounds really good. The width is pretty much perfect for where I like it. It's about plus or minus 55 degrees, you know, 55 this way, 55 that way in terms of the radiation horizontally. Vertically, it's about plus or minus 40 to 50 degrees. So you've got a lot of wiggle room. Now, this speaker was a four-way design, which is very unusual, certainly for today. It had a hyper tweeter at the top, which you see in this video. It's a ported design, was about 42 inches tall, about 58 or so pounds heavy, eight ohm, but 3.2 ohm minimum. Spec power was 50 watts to 200 watts input. Sensitivity spec at 89 decibels, featuring two six and a half inch midwoofers, a coaxial that had a six and a half inch mid range and one inch dome tweeter, and then a small hyper tweeter at the top that's about three quarters inch. On the back, you have the option of standard flat anechoic response or cut base or lifted bait. Depending on how far the speakers were away from nearby boundaries, you would just plug up these options and figure out which one you wanted to go. So in free space, if your speakers were about a meter off the wall, then you just leave them as the flat response in the base. If you put them close to the wall, you would put the cut response. And if you brought them out even further, you might want some additional base. So you'd put it in the lifted position. You could do this simply by plugging up the three holes on the back above the terminals. These speakers were targeted for a smooth estimated in-room response with flat anechoic on-axis response as well. And it works out to provide you with a very good sounding neutral sounding speaker in your listening room with a lot of room to move side to side as well as up and down. And the bass output on these extends down to about 50 hertz for an F3 and the upper 30 hertz region for an F10. The other thing about these speakers that I really like was just the looks. They differ from the Kef look today because the Kef looks today are more boxed. Even the reference series speakers are flat baffle, rectangular shape, where these you can see have a rounded edge to them. And I really like that look. And in fact, I kind of hope maybe Kef might go back to that at some point in the future, just to maybe shake things up. They don't necessarily have to. Now, the, the benefit of having a rounded edge is to reduce diffraction. But with the way that the Kef coaxials are made, they do a good job basically waveguiding the sound to where you don't have really any diffraction issues from that straight edge on the side. In other words, what happens is when you have a flat baffle and you have a wide radiating speaker, that sound hits the edge of that baffle comes back out of phase at a certain frequency, results in a dip, and then maybe a peak pattern until the higher frequencies, it kind of just basically washes itself out. But with a coaxial or a wave guided speaker, usually what happens is that response is more narrow, so it's not radiating out to the edge of the speaker, and therefore you don't have to worry about diffraction. 
So maybe with this design, they went for curved because it's a little bit wider. It seems to me that it actually radiates a little bit more wider than current KEF designs of today. And maybe that five, 10 degrees difference from then versus now is enough to drive them having to use a curved pattern, pattern? baffle back then. Of course, this is all conjecture. I really don't know for sure, but it's just what I'm thinking. I set these speakers out about two to three feet off the back wall. And if you don't know what I mean, here's a graphic illustrating what I'm talking about. So I had this much space between the back of the speaker and the wall behind the speaker. And in this case, it was pretty much perfect. Now I did try to push the speaker closer to the wall. And when I did, it sounded a little bit too boomy. I just used that cut option and lowered the bass a little bit down. In watching movies and listening to music, I never really felt the drastic need for a subwoofer. So in my room, I would say these got down to probably the 40 Hertz region with pretty good authority. Now, not absolute authority. And if I'm listening to stuff that rumbles in the 20 hertz 30 hertz region yeah i would have wanted a subwoofer but for daily listening i never really felt the need for a subwoofer in terms of imaging a lot of that depends on the matching between the speakers and as you get speakers that are older sometimes things change properties change Com crossover components can maybe differ a little bit over time now keep in mind these speakers are at least 20 years old at this point so i can't guarantee that they're perfectly matched i did try to initially measure it but it's hard to align everything perfectly with a tower speaker so i kind of just gave up Still, with that said, what I really appreciated about these speakers was the imaging tightness of things, as well as the radiation. So it sounded like the soundstage was wide without giving a lot of smearing or anything like that due to maybe too broad of a soundstage or too much reflection in the room or maybe non-optimal matching between the speakers. Now let's go ahead and dive into the data, look at some of the results that I got, and then we'll be on our way. All the data that you're about to see is captured using my Clipple Near Field Scanner. It is a state-of-the-art robotic device that allows me to get anechoic data in a non-anechoic room. Up first is the impedance, and you can see that this speaker dips down to about 3.6 ohm above 80 hertz. So right in this region, you're dipping down to about 3.6 ohm. Minimum EPDR is 2.2, which indicates that back in this day, uh, you probably needed an amplifier that was pretty robust to drive these speakers. A standard amplifier with 8 ohm taps or maybe an AVR at that time probably wouldn't do as good of a job driving it, but I really don't know for sure. It's kind of just an educated guess at this point. If you have any differing opinions, of course, let me know. Frequency response, now all these were measured without the grill. Average sensitivity, 88 decibels. It's pretty good at the time. With an F3 of 51 hertz and an F10 of 37 hertz. So as I said, gets down into the room into about the maybe low mid 40 hertz region without much issue, but below that, you're still gonna want a subwoofer. Overall linearity looks quite good within plus or minus three decibels. CEA 2034 data set, again, this looks really good, but the directivity on this speaker also looks really good, which means that you can EQ the speaker to your heart's content if you desire to, if you wanna change things based on what you're getting in room because maybe you don't necessarily like a certain sound signature or you wanna play around with the EQ profile for different songs or anything of that nature. You can easily do that if you want to, although I don't necessarily recommend it. I think when you start playing around with EQ above about 500 hertz for most speakers, you're no longer EQing the room, you're EQing the speaker and you're EQing the tonal balance of that speaker, which is probably the reason you bought the speaker, unless maybe it's a budget speaker and you knew going into it that you were gonna have to equalize some certain aspects of it to get it to sound better overall, but you save money by doing that in the long run. So that's okay. But for a speaker like this, I wouldn't recommend going in and equalizing it. I don't think you really need to. The reason I say that is because the estimated interim response looks pretty good. And this line indicates kind of how I heard the speaker. Now you can see a little bit of a bump that can cause the speaker to sound a little bit, maybe forward, possibly a little bit, maybe nasally, if you will, but I didn't really have any issues in that region. And for the most part, overall, the speaker sounded really good. You can see this bump right here. You can see this bump right here due to the super tweeter. I didn't really have any issues with that in my listening. You may be wondering why I don't have notes on this. I normally put notes on it. Usually it's calling out certain things that stood out to me in my listening, but in my listening, there was really nothing that stood out bad or good. It was just an overall neutral sounding speaker, which is a good thing. Horizontal contour plot shows the horizontal radiation at about plus or minus 55. You could say 50 down here, 55, just kind of depend on where you draw the line. But overall, it seemed pretty wide to me, and it seemed to be a little bit maybe wider than some of the other KEF offerings I've heard of late. Now, this could just be pure anecdotal, Maybe you don't pay any attention to it, but at least that's what it sounded like to me. Vertical is about plus or minus 45. And then we see this issue right here. See all this little weird breakup stuff? This is due to the super tweeter and where it sits on top of that speaker. Harmonic distortion at 86 decibels looks good. 
And then at 96 decibels, still looks good. It's below 1%, above about 80 hertz. Multitone distortion, below my personal 3% line. It's down at 1% for the most part, even up to 96 decibels. So this looks really good as well. Compression also looks good. We can see that Super Tweeter is having some trouble in the higher frequencies at the higher output. But for the most part, the speaker looks pretty damn good. And that does it for this review. To summarize, basically, this speaker is 20 plus years old. Sounds fantastic. Looks great. Again, I kind of really like the overall look of this speaker. And maybe Kef would go back to rounded cabinets. I just don't know that it's necessary. But I just like the whole rounded shape of the speaker. It looks really cool, at least in my opinion. Sound quality is great. Measurements look fantastic. If you can find these on Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist somewhere local for sale for a decent price, pick them up. Just make sure you listen to them first and make sure that they sound pretty similar because over time, components can fail. And depending on the person who owned them before, maybe they might have abused the speaker. Hopefully they didn't. Luckily, the guy that I got these from, these were in pristine condition, still came with the grills. Everything was there. And I had no problem with concerns about testing an older speaker like Sometimes I get older speakers and they just look like they've been put through it, but these didn't. Yeah. So if you like what you see here and you want to help support the channel, you can do so one of two main ways. One is you can go to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner and support me. And by doing that, you get some inside information, access to polls, early viewing of videos, things of that nature. Alternatively, if you have to buy anything from Crutchfield or Best Buy or Target or Newegg or Samsung, I've got a whole list of generic affiliate links in my description below. Click any of those links and then buy whatever it is you want to buy because that helps me earn a small commission at no additional cost to you. And that's really how I keep doing what I'm doing and I'm able to pay for shipping for some of these older items and provide you with some cool data for some cool stuff. All right, I'll talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.